On the morning of October 12, 1964, a drab green bus pulled up near a launch pad at the Soviet spaceport called the Baikonur Cosmodrome in bleak and dreary Kazakhstan. The door opened and three small men in soft white aviator caps and what looked like wool leisure suits stepped down. They were dressed more for a cruise ship than a spaceship. They were very serious, almost grim, as they filed toward the launch pad, like men walking to the gallows, and with good reason. A monstrous rocket loomed ten stories high on the launch pad, steaming and hissing like a giant boiler ready to burst, towering above the rusty sands of the surrounding desert. Standing under it, another small man, this one in a spiffy Soviet Air Force uniform, hugged each of the three in turn, kissing their cheeks, acting far more cheerful than they were. He could afford to be. He was the cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. He'd been the first man in space back in 1961. He'd survived his near-death experience in the same sort of space capsule they were about to fly in. He'd thrown himself into space and lived to tell about it. That was their turn to try their luck. The trio rode up to the top of the rocket in an open elevator. One at a time, they wriggled through a small hatch in the rocket's pointy nose, then stuffed themselves like Vienna sausages into a ridiculously tiny space capsule. They were packed so tight, they were practically in one another's laps, elbows tucked in, no room to move anything but their heads. Three small men in leisure suits waiting to be fired into space, without helmets, without spacesuits, with a limited supply of oxygen, with virtually no safety gear, and with no way to exit the capsule if the launch went wrong. Which, given the state of Soviet space technology in 1964, it certainly could. The model of rocket they were sitting on top of, called an R-7, was notoriously tetchy with a record of spectacular and catastrophic launch explosions. Why were they risking their lives in this way? Was there a scientific rationale for this flight? No. Would it be a step forward in the progress of manned spaceflight? Not really. This mission was entirely a political one. Since the launch of Sputnik in 1957, Soviet rockets had given Nikita Khrushchev, leader of the USSR, opportunity after opportunity to troll the Americans about their inferior and tardy space program. It had become a kind of drug to him, and he was addicted to it. The three men squeezed into the tip of the R-7 monster that morning were there because Khrushchev was jonesing for another chance to show up the Americans. Six months earlier, Khrushchev had been upset by NASA's announcement that its new Gemini program would put a two-man capsule in orbit by late 1964 or early 1965. This would be a first. In space race terms, NASA's first first. The Americans had trailed the Soviet space program until then, and Khrushchev wanted it to stay that way. He summoned the man who'd given him the Sputnik and Gagarin victories, chief designer Sergei Pavlovich Korolyov. If the Americans were going to put two people in space by the end of the year, Khrushchev said, then he wanted to launch three people and do it before the Americans launched. By the anniversary of the Bolsheviks' revolution on November 7th would do nicely. Korolyov tried to explain in technical detail that it would take much longer than that to develop a three-man vehicle and a rocket powerful enough to lift it into orbit. Khrushchev had grown up a farm boy and factory worker and confessed that his grasp of engineering was not good. He liked his chief designer, who had given him some great propaganda coups over the Americans, but he wanted another. So when Korolyov told him that what he asked for couldn't be done, Khrushchev in effect replied, make it so. There was indeed no time to develop a new three-person vehicle 
or a rocket big enough to launch it. Korolyov and his engineers could only try to convert the one-man Vostok capsule that they'd been using since Gagarin's historic flight in 1961. The Vostok was like a large BB pellet, more space ordnance than spacecraft, an aluminum sphere roughly eight feet in diameter. When cosmonaut Alexei Leonov saw one for the first time, he was shocked that it was so small and round. I had imagined a totally different type of space capsule, something more sleek and dynamic. He also couldn't get over how cramped it was inside. Like all cosmonauts, he was not tall, only five foot seven, but he didn't see how he would be able to fit. In fact, Vostok was designed for a rider no taller than five foot six. And now they were planning to cram three of them into it. Korolyov's team stripped the Vostok interior nearly clean, then struggled to squeeze three seats in where there'd only been one. The seats just barely fit the space, but there was obviously no way to stuff three cosmonauts in bulky spacesuits into a space that had already been cramped for just one. One of Korolyov's leading engineers, Konstantin Feoktistov, suggested that three small men might fit if they did not wear spacesuits, which meant that if the cabin depressurized, they'd die quick but agonizing deaths. When Korolyov asked who would be insane enough to do that, Feoktistov volunteered. Two other small men were chosen to accompany him. Even in their leisure suits, the trio still couldn't be squeezed into the capsule, so Korolyov asked for another sacrifice. The capsule's cosmonaut ejecting apparatus had to go. They would be the first Soviet spacemen to land inside their capsule. Why Yuri Gagarin and the other early cosmonauts did not land inside their Vostoks is partly a matter of geography, but more a matter of the neurotic Soviet obsession with secrecy. Project Mercury astronauts enjoyed the luxury of splashing down softly in the ocean because the U.S. was surrounded by temperate waters and had a very large navy for retrievals, thus Cape Canaveral. The Soviets put the Cosmodrome out in the middle of nowhere, where activities, and especially failures, were far from prying eyes. For such a vast landmass, the USSR had little access to waters that weren't icy, not ideal for landing a spacecraft in. The Cosmodrome was surrounded by vast tracts of flat, featureless, remote steppe, and that's where Vostok capsules came down. They were hard landings that could kill any cosmonaut inside, and eventually did. So, Vostok missions relied on ejector seats. When the descending vehicle reached a certain altitude, explosive bolts blew away a hatch cover above the cosmonaut's head. More explosive bolts fired the cosmonaut's ejector seat through the opening. If all went right, the cosmonaut floated to the ground under a parachute, as though they jumped from a passing plane instead of bursting out of a plummeting spacecraft. So, the next time you feel inclined to go on about what space cowboys America's early astronauts were, you should picture their Soviet counterparts, male and female, being fired out of their hurtling BBs at high altitude. Not because it was good science, but because their bosses in the government wanted them to be far away from public view. The story of the Soviet space program is a litany of such oddball make-do workarounds, most of which the Soviets brought on themselves. There was absolutely no room for three ejector seats in the capsule. Instead, Fyoktitsov and others designed a new braking system with parachutes and small retro rockets. An unmanned test was a dismal failure and would have killed anyone on board. Members of Korolyov's team took to calling the capsule the Space Grave. The silly mission, a gifted designer on Korolyov's team, 
condemned the project as a circus act. Likely, he was thinking of a clown car. It was determined that even in their leisure suits, the cosmonauts weighed too much. They were put on a strict diet. So it was that on October 12, 1964, the three small, half-starved Soviet men, wearing no protective gear and with no hope of emergency evacuation, squashed themselves into an oversized BB pellet and were fired into space. Despite all the odds against it, the mission turned out to be remarkably problem-free during the 24-hour, 16-orbit flight. The next day, the world's first space trio banged down to the ground in northern Kazakhstan. Miraculously, the new braking measures worked, and they prized themselves out of the capsule shaken up, but unharmed. Korolyov was as surprised as anyone. Is it really true that it's all over? The crew has returned from space without a single scratch? Not for the first or last time. He had pried open the jaws of defeat, stuck his head in, reached all the way down defeat's throat, and yanked out victory. <laughs>